Good morning. The faithful few. Huh? I like that. We're beginning a new series uh, today. We're going to be looking at the parables of Jesus. Very powerful. A lot of times when we come to the parables, maybe we've heard them a lot. Maybe we've heard them in Sunday school as a kid, or, or maybe sometimes we come across them as sort of like little sermon illustrations, you know? We're going to sprinkle a little parable into our topic of the day. Well, in this series, actually, what we want to do is allow the parables to speak with the full authority that Jesus had in mind. And so to do that, a lot of times it takes a little background to understand the the context in which these parables are being spoken. And so we're going to be going through today a parable that only shows up in Matthew. In fact, I can find a really good title for it, a parable of grace. However, with most of our Bibles and most of our upbringing, we've heard it as the parable of the workers or the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So one of the challenges to hearing a familiar parable is we think, oh, I've heard that before. I've heard that a thousand times. I know what it's about. I, well, are you sure about that? It's interesting to me as I come to these parables and I dig into them and I study them out, and it's just an astounding thought that begins to rise to the surface of this parable. And it's grace. As we get to God's grace, sometimes that's an upending, upside down kind of proposition for us. See, we live in a world where you pretty much need to earn your way, or you need to, you know, the worker deserves his wages, and the idea that if you do a really good job, then you deserve really good rewards, and you really got to make your way and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and so forth and so on. We live in that kind of a world. And so then when we come to grace and we realize undeserved favor, unmerited favor, a gift to us, and we can't earn it, all of a sudden we begin to have some challenges is comprehending that. And grace has a tendency to kind of turning everything upside down and the things we thought were right are wrong and the things we thought were wrong are suddenly revealed to be forgiven and it just messes with us. It messes with us because the world we live in doesn't quite work according to those principles. And so I want to give us the backdrop of what was happening for our parable today. Let's start with this. Peter is going to ask Jesus a question, okay? Peter is very disturbed, (laughs) which happens a lot when you hang around with Jesus. He just says some things that mess with us, right? Well, Jesus had just said something that really challenges the way Peter viewed the world. And Peter is often kind of the self-named spokesman, right? He spoke for the whole group of disciples. So they were all pretty much disturbed by something Jesus had said. He had said something along the lines that uh, being saved is impossible with men, and, and especially rich people. Oh, how hard it is for a rich man to be saved, right? And he goes on to say it's so impossible, it's like a camel squeezing through the eye of a needle. Now, he's not talking about some mysterious gate outside of Israel. There was no such thing. That was like a little error that popped up in teaching in the third century. What he was really saying is how impossible it is for someone to be saved who's rich. But then he goes on to say how impossible it is for anyone to be saved apart from the grace of God. In other words, what is impossible with men is possible with God. So this challenged them. This messed them up. They didn't understand what Jesus was getting at, right? And so Peter wants to ask a question because he thought, listen, if you're blessed by God, then you're given a lot of rewards. If you're blessed by God, then you're, you're wealthy. And it was kind of a Jewish mindset that said that people, if they were really blessed by God, had lots of wealth and treasures and property, and, and they begin to, to get a little askew, and so they ask this question of Jesus. Let's take a look at it. This is found in Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. Peter asks a question. Peter asked, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? He's a little disturbed. Things are kind of upside down for him right now. He's not quite understanding what Jesus is getting at. Jesus let that rich young ruler walk away because he wouldn't give everything up and follow him. And that began to ask Peter, well, then what what are we going to get? We left everything to follow you. What's in it for us, Jesus? Kind of what he's asking, right? Sometimes we have a tendency to maybe ask the same thing. Sometimes we come to some of the hard teachings in the Bible and go, this stuff is tough. And so Jesus is like, is there anything good for us? What about us? We've given up everything. We're following you. We've forsaken the world's idea of success, and we're following you. What's in it for us, Jesus? So he asks the question. He wants to kind of know what's going on. Have we misunderstood something, Jesus? Do you need to set us straight? And then Jesus gives an answer. And it's interesting. This answer is almost perfect. I mean, this answer is almost exactly what we need to hear. This answer is so close to being perfect, I think Jesus just misses it, though. Yeah, I said it. Jesus just messes it up somehow for us. Let's take a look at it. We'll see how Jesus answered this. Matthew 19, 28. 
So Jesus answered him. He said, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Ooh, this is sounding good. This is, a sound, this is like an awesome privilege right there. They, they have a high place in the kingdom. They got, they got a special place. This is pretty good. Then Jesus goes on. He says, and everyone, that's us. We're included here. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields, we can say or workplaces or comfortable living or we can give a thousand different things that Jesus is referencing here. He says, anyone who has done that for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. That's an awesome answer. And if he would have left it there, it would have been perfect. If he would have just stopped right there, Jesus, he could have just walked away. He nailed the message. We love that answer. If I'm going to follow you, Jesus, you're going to reward me a hundred times over. Whatever sacrifice I give you, you're going to reward me a hundred times over. Then he would fit in line with all the TV preachers and the radio evangelists and the health and wealth. I mean, it would fit right on in there, right? That would be perfect. Why couldn't he have stopped there? Because then we would have a pretty shallow understanding of God's generosity and grace to all people. Think about this. So Jesus then goes on to the next sentence that I want to let you know this sets up the parable. It's a a kind of a confusing sentence. And people have kind of gotten weird ideas about it. So let's see what Jesus says the very next sentence. But many. It's like all of a sudden they're reveling in the excitement of what Jesus said. Yeah, I'm sitting on a throne. I'm going to be judging one of the tribes. I want the tribe of Judah. And I'm going to be special. And I'm getting all these 100 time rewards. Woo, this is cool. And he didn't even hear the but. What? Did, what, what? Breaks him out of his revelry all of a sudden. And Jesus is still talking. Oh, maybe there's more good stuff. But, says Jesus, many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be first. What? Jesus is saying, things don't always appear as they appear. Things are not always as they seem to us. Think of it. Let me paraphrase it this way. Check it out. Those who appear to be first and winners may be last and losers. And those who appear to be losers and last may actually be first and winners. In other words, things may be a little upside down according to our judgments. Things may be a little bit skewed according to our standards. All of a sudden, this is a really strange thought. We're talking about rewards and service, and Jesus spins it all around, and now he's talking about grace and who gets into the kingdom. And if he would have left it there, we would have all been considerably confused, I think. But then he goes on to tell this parable. This thing, as as another place we'll get to down the road, this thing called a parable. These things that have been hidden since the foundation of the world. Jesus is now revealing them to us so that we can better understand God's grace. So he goes on to start a parable, a parable only found here in Matthew. And what I love about Matthew is, you know, tax collector, customs inspector. Clearly, he would have had the capabilities of writing down what Jesus said word for word. Maybe he knew a short term or a shorthand, excuse me, where he's writing these stuff down. That's why Matthew's one of my favorite gospels, because you find so many of Jesus' direct words recorded for us. Well, it's just such an occasion. He records this awesome parable for us. So let us together unpack this parable of grace to see if we can get a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about. So check it out. So Jesus is going into this parable, and Jesus says this. This is Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like... Okay, he's not talking about labor unions... He's not talking about a good wage to set up for your employees. He's not talking about employer-employee relationships. None of these are the issues. They may be in the background of this parable, but it has nothing to do with that because he just told us what it has to do with. The kingdom of God. If you want to know what the kingdom of God is like, he's about to tell you. If you want to know what grace is like, he's about to tell you. So he's giving us a clue right off the bat of what he's talking about. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. Okay, let's stop. Hold on. Here's one of the problems. Uh, Anyone around in the first century in Israel worked in a vineyard? Anyone here did that in the first century Israel? No, probably not. Now, we do have people in this church that know a thing or two about harvest time. 
You know what I'm talking about? There's this interesting thing that comes around during the year, and it's called harvest. And it's so busy, so hectic in our day and age that a lot of times the family members as part of our church, they're not going to see their spouses very often. They're working hard. And in fact, this time of the year may very well set the profitability for the entire year. If this harvest doesn't come through, if it doesn't get brought in, if it doesn't get shipped, it doesn't get delivered, it doesn't get packaged, it's over, right? There's not going to be another season. And so when we come to this, it was the same way in the first century. There was seasons of harvest. And if you imagine a vineyard, these would have been grapes. They're fragile. They don't last very long. They need special care and attention. And so in that day and age, harvest time would be a very stressful time of the year, a time in which a lot of extra workers might need to be hired because there's so much work. It's interesting that normally in Israel in that time, the work hour, the work day was about 11 hours. It was about 6 a.m. to about 5 p.m. Well, we get a feeling that this parable Jesus is telling us is probably the harvest because it's 6 to 6. He's working people from sunup to sundown, and he needs workers. Now, let me give you another backdrop. See, if you understand these things, the parable will really resonate for you. You begin to understand what's going on. The other backdrop is the poverty rate I had read uh, not too long ago. The poverty rate in Israel in the first century at times skyrocketed to an excess of 60%. More than half the population could not find work at times. One of the, we, we get excited about, you know, our poverty rate just went down to 5.9. Yay! You know, you know, we're pretty excited about unemployment, 5.9. That's pretty good numbers. What if America had a 60% unemployment? Whoa! I would say that would be pretty crazy. And one of the reasons was, is in that day and age, you had a lot of agrarian societies. I mean, they did fishing, and they ran their own family farms, and occasionally Rome would do a big building project, and they had lots of those. I mean, during Herod's temple, he employed nearly everybody in the whole region. And so they would have this lucrative work, way better than staying in the family farm. They would shut down the family farm or just kind of have it eke by while they went to work for the government. And they made lots of money in doing so, but then the project would end. And the next project wouldn't always start right away. And so now they're going back and they're scrambling to their family farms or they're going back to shepherding or they're going back to the fishing industry and all of a sudden it's a really rough environment. Well, in that day and age, the same as our day and age, you had something known as a day laborer, right? A daily worker, someone who did not find regular work for himself, but was looking for that day's wage. We have them today. You can drive into Yuba City, and you can go there early in the morning and register with them, and if they have work, they'll provide it to you, right? It's just one day's work, normally speaking, and you get paid pretty much one day's wages. Well, in that day and age, they had the same thing. These people were frequently those who were desperate for work. They didn't have regular work, and so they would line up in the marketplace and wait to be hired to see if one of the vineyard owners during harvest time would say, okay, you come with me, you come with me, and they would hire them, and they would get a chance to work. And so these people were frequently pretty desperate. They were desperate. A lot of them had families, and the difference between eating or not eating would fall down to as to whether they could get work. So it was desperate for them. You know, we think about day laborers in our day and age. A lot of times the wage that was paid was just a daily wage. In Jesus' time, it was called a denarius. It was a coin. And if you worked a day's work, you got a denarius. And you're hoping that denarius is going to meet your needs for the day. But just as our day and age, it doesn't always meet all the needs, does it? You could have needed some gas to get to the labor ready. You could have needed some money, and you haven't even eaten yet because you don't have money. So lunchtime comes around, you need that daily wage before you can even buy food. So come the end of the day, maybe you're hoping it's enough money to not only buy you some more work gloves, put some fuel in your car, get you a meal, and maybe a hotel room for the night because you've been sleeping in your car. Maybe you can get a real shower for once. Now some of you are thinking, oh gosh, I can't even relate to that. Really? There's a lot of people on Wall Street that couldn't either, but they're living in their cars now. There's a lot of people who went through the dot-com industry. They couldn't believe it either. They're living out of their cars sometimes. There's a lot of people who went through... These are serious people who made six-figure incomes that had some serious problems, and it wasn't mental illness nor addictions that found them getting there. So sometimes we stop and say, that could be a hard way to live. Let me share with you a brief experience in my life. I remember selling cars when I first went into the Ford, uh, selling Ford automobiles. I had to go in retail because that's where everyone gets their start. Retail sucks. It sucks. 
And retail car sales is the worst. I mean, you thought furniture sales was hard. Retail car sales is hard. Let me give you a little expression or a little taste of what was going on. So you come in retail, they put you in very expensive Italian shoes, or at least they encourage you to buy nice clothes, right? You got your slacks, your tie when I first started there, and you got 30 other people next to you. Young whippersnappers that are hungry and aggressive and assertive, and they want to sell a car. And here you are, you're like, I got to pay my power bill. I need a couple hundred bucks, all right? My power's going to be shut off in a week. And I remember this. And I had no money for groceries, right? Hadn't been paid, and payday's still a good nine days away. But they had something in the industry known as spiffs. I practically lived off them. What a spiff was is if you sold a car, and it was a certain car, or met a certain criterion, they give you cash money. You get to take it home that day. It's like a daily worker's wage. At the end of the shift, which, by the way, was Jewish law, you would have to be paid. So I remember thinking, I need to sell a car tonight. Okay? I need tonight because... Mama needs a new pair of shoes. We need money. We need groceries. I got power bills. I got problems. This is entry into retail. And so it's interesting. I remember standing there, and we're calling colors. I mean, you talk about a very humbling experience. You know, you're, you're approaching 30 years of age in your life, and you're thinking you just had a successful business. You sold that, and now you're standing on pavement in uncomfortable shoes with 20-something-year-olds around you, and there's 30 of you, and you're fighting over the next car that might come into the lot. Blue, red, Taurus, Taurus, no, that's a Subaru, mine, Subaru, mine. And all these people are yelling for cars. And so you have to fight 30 people just to get to talk to the customer. And then you've got to deal with the customer. They don't like you. They don't trust you. They don't want to talk to you, but they're considering a car. And I remember just being in that environment, just saying, oh Lord, well, how did I get here? And God was like, if you talked with me a little more often, maybe you wouldn't have got here. So I remember, I remember just standing there going, okay, and finally just hoping that car would come in. And, and, and invariably, I would get that car sale. But it was rare. The desperation for a daily laborer in this day and age and in Jesus' day and age was huge. For some people, it was the difference between eating or not eating. And so they were lining up to get work. And Jesus is telling this parable for us to understand. He wanted us to get a feel for what God's grace was like. And so now let's pick it back up. So the kingdom of God is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent, him, sent them into his vineyard. Okay, so you had an acceptance, right? You had an offer and an acceptance and the meeting of the mind. What do we call that? A contract! You had an offer, an acceptance, and the meeting of the mind. So he had a contract with them, and they had a contract. So there was a clearly negotiated, it's the beginning of the day, it's 6 a.m., the sun is coming up, and he is contracted for his workers, and he invites them to go get some work. They know they have a day's wage now. They know they're good. As we go to hear this parable about Jesus, it's not a nice day like today. It's not a somewhat cool day with a little breeze coming in. This is a brutal day. It's a hot day. It's harvest time. Everyone's under stress. Everyone's pressured. It seems to be a miserable day, not even a nice breeze to keep you company. And there's no lunch break. In the Jewish world, they generally had a morning meal and an evening meal. There was no labor unions, no 15-minute breaks per hour, none of that stuff. They were jobbing it. And if they didn't job it really, really good, they may never get another day's wage. You add to that that this may very well have been a Friday. You're like, so? Listen, in the Jewish culture, you know what happened on Saturdays? They had something called the Sabbath. They weren't allowed to work. So if he didn't get the work done, if this work didn't happen, that harvest wasn't brought in. It's ruined. It's lost. Because it's going to be going till Sunday or Monday, right? And so he's probably under a good deal of stress, as is everyone. So it tells us what happens. He picks up the first ones at 6 a.m. Verse 3. About the third hour, that's about 9 a.m., about the third hour, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. It begins to tell you how desperate they are, right? They didn't even ask terms. They were just happy to have work. They had already missed the first inv invitation of the day. And apparently he realized there's a lot of more work, so he goes to get more workers. And they're like, uh, whatever, you'll pay me what is fair? Okay, cool. They were putting an awful lot of trust, weren't they? There was no real contract there, was there? It was just an invitation based on the character of the vineyard owner. That's it. 
Listen, in this day and age, that can get you into some trouble. Just trusting people. It don't work. To, oh, trust me. It's okay. Car sales people say that all the time. Oh, trust me. It's fine. No, no. So they went out. So it says he went out again about the sixth hour. This is about noon. And then again at the ninth hour, which is about 3 p.m. And he did the same. About the eleventh hour, he went out and he found still others standing around. The eleventh hour. That's like 5 p.m. That's the end of a normal work day. I mean, how desperate must they have been, right? How hard-pressed. I tell you, I remember watching the hours tick away as I'm standing on the concrete counting cars and just fighting other people to even talk to a customer. And then your odds of actually selling a car are roughly 12 to 20%, depending on your skill level with the client. Even if you have the perfect car, everything's right. There's still a transaction that must take place. So you're a long shot. And the hours are ticking away. And your hope of even having a meal is looking pretty bleak. It's cabbage soup again, or hamburger helper, or any macaroni and cheese. I mean, come on, y'all, ramen noodles. Y'all been there, right? And so I remember living like that. It was my introduction to retail. It's amazing that I survived it because that job turned into well over six figures when I got into fleet, but that's a story for another occasion. So I remember how desperate it was for the last second, right? Watching the hours tick away. This is not going to happen for me. That must have been what it was like for them. It's the 11th hour. It's 5 p.m. Now there's no hope for them. They're hanging around because maybe some worker will have them or some owner will have them clean up the job site so the other guys can go home early. Maybe. And so they're standing there and here comes the vineyard owner. He's like, what are you doing? Come on, go to work. And now they get a chance. Maybe the chance. Maybe they'll get enough coin to at least go to a tavern or a pub or to buy at least one meal for them, right? They don't know. Maybe they're just getting you know, just enough to get by. And so it tells us in the 11th hour, this vineyard owner is still seeking workers. So, it goes on, verse 7. So he asked them, uh, why have you been standing here all day long? Verse 7, because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Okay. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first ones. Okay, so he's like foreman. He calls his foreman, the boss, and he says, oh, you can start paying them. But I want you to start with the last ones and work your way to the first. And so perhaps the landowner goes over here, and now he's dealing with which parts of this product and harvest is going to be shipped, and which are going to stay locally for farmer's market. And he's doing all his work with an earshot of what's going on with his workers, because now they're getting paid. Jewish law says you have to give them their money at the end of the day, which is a good thing, because some of them would not survive. So the workers, uh, so it tells us right here, when that happened, he starts going and having them paid. Verse 9, the workers who were hired about the 11th hour, those desperate guys that barely got in, they came and each received a denarius. What? They, see, they received 12 times what they were supposed to get. They received an entire day's wage for just showing up at the end of the shift. This is amazing. This is an astounding bit of mercy. What generosity. No one does that. No one, no, con no one gives that kind of amazing, just right off the bat, you've been here less than an hour, they were astounded. But then something else began to happen. Those who were lining up, they began to think, hey, 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 spiff, bonus, special money coming our way. If he's generous with them that just Johnny come lately, what's it gonna be for us? This is awesome. And they were getting their hopes up. They were wringing their hands together. So, verse 10 so when, so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, you know, the American way, more, more, more. But each one of them also received a denarius. What? They were there all day. They were working, jobbing, hard work, in the sun, no breeze. Remember that? No lunch break, no union boss looking out for them, nothing. Well, it says, when they received it, they began to grumble. Oh, the complaining and whining began. <laughs> Barking and growling. And remember, the landowner's probably just right over here, and he's hearing this. They're like, what? what is this? What is this? These men who were hired last worked only an hour, they grumbled. And you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. You see what's going on there? They're like, this is unfair. How could you do this to me? And what I love about Jesus is he in his parable answers the way he tells us 
to answer. In other words, Jesus is consistent with all of his teachings. Because think about it for a second. All right, you're the vineyard owner. It's your business. It's a busy time of the year. And there's a lot of people who are out of work. They don't get an opportunity to make money for their family. So you're doing an amazing thing by allowing them a job. You're going out and you're inviting them, right? You're, you're saying, come here. I'll give you a day's wage. I'll give you a day's work. Come on, I'm going to help you out. And then these ungrateful little twerps start snaking you and sniping you and saying bad things about you in front of your foreman. This is your foreman. This is the one who regularly works for you. You know, what is this about? So what will we do? I know what I would do. I Listen here, buddy. Get your money and get out of here and don't ever come back here. And if I even see anyone talking to you, I'm not hiring them either. You will never work in this town again, you hear me? You know, isn't that like the normal reaction, right? We're going to set them straight. How dare they? I give you mercy. I give you grace. And you're going to trample my mercy. What? Who do you think you are? See ya. Get out of here. Na, 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 na. Hey, hey, hey. Goodbye. You know what I'm talking about? Because I'm the big boss, man. But notice Jesus does not answer that way in his parable. He does something very foreign to most of us. Check it out. Verse 13. But he answered one of them. Friend friend I'd be like fool he's like friend friend I am not being unfair to you didn't you agree to work for a denarius take your pay and go I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money or are you envious because I am generous and here it comes so the last will be first and the first will be last, says Jesus. You see, there are occasions by which grace can be insulting to us. There are occasions by which grace can be offensive to us. Did you catch the insult in this? Let me me remind you here. The insult of grace, you heard him say it, you have made them equal with us. Being to catch the complaint, Jesus, I've been serving you for all these years. You let these little Johnny come lately, he's pop in the church, these lazy, do good nothing people, all they want is your mercy and your gifts. They don't serve you, they serve themselves, and you're going to make them equal with me? What kind of nonsense is this, Jesus? What? what do you mean everyone gets a cupcake? Everyone finishes the race? Everyone gets first place? Everyone gets a ribbon? What kind of, why should I work so hard if everybody gets into heaven? What kind of nonsense is this? You're just going to let anyone in if they come and submit to you? If they accept Jesus, they just get in no matter what? If they come to you and they say, yes, uncle, you're just going to let them in like that? What is this? How many times you thought about it this way? Some at the very end of their lives, they were a nasty little rat their whole life. Mean and cruel and hurting people and abusing people. And then right on their deathbed, in the last 10 seconds, they sneak in and say, okay, Jesus, please forgive me. And you're going to forgive them, Jesus? What about us? We come to church every week. We pay the bills around here. Jesus, have you been noticing my tithe checks been making these lights stay on? Jesus, have you noticed how many gifts I've given to the church? Jesus, do you see me preaching for you? What do you mean this little, this little rat is going to get in? Okay, please tell me he's going to have a segregated part of heaven. Heaven, right where only the rats go to you got lucky to get in there buddy but you stay in rat town because all of us really good christians we're going to be uptown you know what i mean there's going to be a downtown and up. you see what's going on you see grace offends our pride sometimes it's hard for us to deal with i remember being told when i first started to get into the ministry and i felt god gave a call on my life and i began to work through what that really means i'm quitting so I remember turning in my notice. At this point, I'd been with Givaki almost a decade and making lots of money, and you know the routine. And uh, the serv- my people in the service department, friends of mine, began to just really lay into me, teasing me and mocking me and telling me, what are you, nuts? You have a responsibility to your children. you got little children. You're going to walk away from six figures to do what? To be a pastor? Aren't there enough pastors out there? I mean, you're saved by grace. You mean, I'm going to get into heaven, and I'm not doing any of that nonsense. I'm going to keep my good job. I'm going to take care of my family. My kids aren't going to go without stuff, but you're going to go let your family suffer for what? It's by grace. You don't have to earn it, buddy. Come on, Sean, snap out of it. Stay here. This is where you belong. This is the earning income years of your life. You're going to take your highest quality earning income, and you're going to throw it away? What about retirement? What about health care? These churches, they don't take care of their people. They're fickle people. They're here one week, they get angry about the coffee temperature, and they drive down the next week, and they're into the next church. They don't like something you say. You say a bad joke, and now they're going to the next church. These people are fickle. You can't trust them. What are you doing? But you know what's funny is when they first said that to me, it actually hit. I thought, oh my gosh, my house is up for sale. I'm leaving a great job. Maybe I am being irresponsible. I am saved by grace. What am I doing? This is crazy. 
And then a thought began to come to me. You see, we're invited to serve God. We're given a great opportunity to serve God. My service doesn't earn me a place in heaven. Your service doesn't earn you a place in heaven. Nobody gets into heaven except by the generous mercy of God's grace. So that when we serve him, we're not earning anything. When we give a tithe check, that's not getting us extra bonus points towards our salvation. It doesn't work like that. You don't get frequent flyer miles from earth to heaven for doing some great charity. It's not about that. It's God's generous grace. And so listen to this quote. I love this as I came across it this week. It says that grace speaks a word of mercy over us as we run the race marked out for our life. And everyone finishes in a dead heat a photo finish. That means when it comes to grace, you betcha everyone gets a ribbon. When it comes to grace, everyone who responds to Jesus is saved. When it comes to grace and mercy, everyone enters into heaven by the same way through Jesus Christ and our repentance and acceptance of that fact. That as someone once said, when you come to the cross, indeed, it is indeed level. That I'm not greater than you and you're not greater than me. We're all looking to the one who's greater than all. Jesus Christ. It's by God's generous mercy by which we are saved. It's grace and it's awesome and it's majestic. But frequently what happens is that's not the way we understand things. We think that people have to earn it, you know? You got to really put in your hours here at church. You got to clock a few sermon hours before you're getting into heaven, buddy. You got to clock in a few charity deeds. You got to, you got to clock. No, no, you don't. Anything you do is a result of of the overwhelming grace of God that comes into your life, that which he's opened up for you. You see, I remember thinking, uh, just as I was coming into ministry, I did chair ministry. That was my very, very, some of y'all helped me when I was there. I'm looking out and seeing you. Chair ministry was my very first ministry other than handing out bulletins. I knew God had called me, and I didn't know to have a job. I'd quit my job not knowing what was going to happen. I put my house up for sale not knowing what's going to happen. I knew it. I, it's been over eight months languishing on their idea, but I knew God had called me. And I remember that first early ministry, and I was stacking chairs and unstacking chairs, and I was at our Cuba City campus. I don't know if you've been there, but it's a church of roughly, at that point, 2,000. And you had to put out like 800, 900 chairs for the service, and then you had to pick them back up and put them away because they had other events happening. And when I had help, it's like 20 minutes. But when I didn't have help, hours, hours. You set it up, you look around at the end of service, everyone's like, oh, we want to go to lunch. Everyone's all happy and have a good old time, fat, happy, lazy church people. They all disappear, and I'm there by myself, and I remember stacking chairs, like, oh, I could be at IHOP. They're stacking chairs and putting them away with, this is what you called me to? I went from six figures to this? This is terrible. And I remember whining and moping and groping and being upset, thinking about all the lazy, fat church people. All they want to do is come and be blessed by God. All they want to do is come hear something nice, motivate me, pastor, and all this cool stuff and I remember just stacking these chairs saying what what am I getting for this deal this is nonsense and it's funny if I wouldn't have learned the lesson in that ministry I couldn't do this ministry it's interesting so stacking the chairs being upset whining and complaining and then it kind of came to me God was like do you know what I, what's going on with these chairs I'm like yeah I'm laying out all these chairs for lazy people to sit around in yeah I know what's going on he's like uh-uh mm-mm. I'm saving people in those chairs. And we get to serve God? We get to. It's not a have to. We get the opportunity, and it does not earn anything. Yes, there's rewards in heaven. That's what Jesus said. There's rewards in heaven. But what we need to get our grip around is the reality that we want everyone to come to know Jesus and be saved. That means we serve out of love and a desire for others to know Jesus. That means whether we do tasks that no one sees, like going and getting the food for the food bank ministry, or we do other tasks like the handful, the faithful few that showed up to scrape and ruin their backs as they laid out the concrete for our church. That means the other people that are working on the garden gardening. People don't see that. The ones that are folding the bulletins to get it ready, all these things that happen, they don't see that. But you know, we're not doing it to earn anything. We're doing it because we love Jesus. And if we don't have that motive, what a terrible way to do ministry. What a horrible way to do ministry if you're doing it begrudgingly, right? God says, no, I've got better for you. And I am going to bless you in this life and the next. But hello, there are people who don't know Jesus yet. You're going to help them. And so as I begin to realize how awesome and amazing grace is, I am so thankful, as Chuck Smith once said, that Jesus said that he's going to, we're looking to hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I am so thankful that those words are not, well done, my good and very clever servant. 
right? That somehow we got to achieve something super clever for God or we're not in. No, we're in through the grace of Jesus Christ. And we get that, we can celebrate. So think about it this way. We so may very well be end up in heaven and we're walking down the new Jerusalem and we're in the amazing streets. We're looking at all the buildings and the parks and the rivers and the trees that bear fruit, a different fruit each month. And we're having these relationships that we've started here. And then suddenly we catch some movement out of our corner of our eye and we look over and we go, what? How did he get in here? That's insane. God, what's wrong with your standards? That guy was a weasel. I don't, I don't know if I want to be in heaven with him. And all of a sudden, he comes walking up. He's happy with his buddies, and he sees you, and he goes, what? She made it in here? Did she, she's just an idiot. How did... Grace is an upside-down kind of proposition, isn't it? And so isn't it funny how we as human beings get to a place where we're not quite sure we want to celebrate everyone who encounters grace. We're not quite sure we want to accept everybody that Jesus is inviting. We kind of have a limit to who we want to celebrate if they show up in this building or or they show up somewhere to praise Jesus. We're not quite sure. But you know what? Jesus says the angels are sure. When a single person repents and comes to know Jesus Christ, what does the scripture tell us? There's a party in heaven. The heavenly host celebrates every person who comes to know Jesus Christ. There's a celebration for grace going on, a celebration of God's mercy going on, and I just say maybe, just maybe, we can celebrate too. Maybe we can just release ourselves from the burden of judging all of humanity and instead embrace God's grace and let others come to know just a taste of how generous God is. You know, God's been good to me. I look back to the life I had and the life I have now, no comparison on any level. No, I don't make the kind of income that I made, but through the generosity of God's people, I've never missed a payment on anything. I've never been without. I've never hurt for anything financially. It's just bizarre. How can my income be cut in half and then somehow I have more than I ever had, well, ever, ever had before? Isn't that interesting? God rearranges your priorities. It isn't about health and wealth, but it is about grace. He has been good to me. How about you? Has God been generous to you? Has he been good to you? Has he seen you through a few dark nights of the soul? Has he seen you through a few trials? Has he led you and loved you and cared for you and shown you compassion? Good, let's celebrate that and let's let other people experience it too. Would you stand up? Father, thank you for the opportunity to be reminded that your grace is amazing. It truly is something we can celebrate. That even in your parable, you were telling us, Jesus, that you were going out inviting anybody to come work, come into God's vineyard, come and taste mercy and compassion. Come, everyone's welcome. Respond, turn to God and be healed. It's amazing that you give an invitation that anyone would come, that anyone would turn to Jesus and be saved. You are going out and you are looking for people to come into your vineyard and celebrate the harvest and receive mercy from you. Lord, help us to celebrate and to open our arms to other people who have not yet embraced your grace. Help us not to be a burden to those who are coming to know you. Help us, Lord. We need your help. We we ask for your help. And yes, as, as James said, we breathe in and breathe out your grace, your presence with us and within us, Lord. Help us to focus on that. Everywhere we go in this world, no matter hard or no matter bleak or no matter happy, you are with us each step of the way. Help us to celebrate that grace, the grace of God within us. In Jesus' name, amen.